point of view, it's a privilege to be talking to the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, who's in Ghana doing many things. She visited in Kruma Museum. She's met all the important people. Before she leaves Ghana, she went through a very interesting conversation on AI. She's talking to us about what the outlook is for Ghana. Madam, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, economists are not necessarily the most optimistic people, <laughs> but you seem very optimistic all the time about the world economy. Where from this optimism? Well, it came from, lesson, uh, from the lessons from history. We know that over centuries, the world economy has gone through zigzags, up and down, up and down, up and down. But the general direction is upward. And uh, what is driving uh, that progress in economic life? Technology, accumulation of capital, and economic integration. Uh, we have to be mindful that success is only possible when countries have strong fundamentals to step on. Mm. Good governance, good institutions, good policies. Some can call you the crisis managing director. You took over in 2019, <laughs> COVID 2020, brief recovery 2021, 2022, currency crisis everywhere, inflation 2023. When will the recovery come for the world? What we are seeing is that uh, the world economy has been surprisingly more resilient than we thought it would be. And the foundation for this resilience is lessons learned, especially after the 2008 global financial crisis, that helped us have a strong, more resilient banking sector to have good fiscal buffers, sound policies. What we are seeing this year is growth is slightly above what we projected earlier, around 3.1%. Inflation is going down. What, what does it tell us? Monetary policy actions of central banks work. And uh, in Africa in particular, Finally, some sun on the horizon of those countries that want to go to markets with uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Kenya, tapping into financial resources after a period of doors being closed. One challenge, though, has been how monetary and fiscal policy sometimes don't work <laughs> together. So central banks are doing their best with their rates, but some of our inflation mm -hmm. is supply side. So mm -hmm. some of that is difficult. And the, the financial guys are also trying, fiscal guys, are also trying to protect the poor. Elections right. are also coming. Right. How do you resolve that? With great difficulty. Uh, from uh, the beginning of the uh, in spike in inflation, my message was, it is like driving a car with the monetary policy putting a foot on the brake. Fiscal policy should not press the accelerator because then we are for a crash. Uh, I recognize it is very difficult for uh, finance authorities because they have to rebuild buffers for the next shock to come. And at the same time, they have to invest in, in people, in digital infrastructure. How do you do that? By having a medium term anchor for your fiscal plans. You don't have to adjust Today, you have to adjust over time. And of course, if you want the books to close well, raise revenues and improve the quality of spending. Will growth from, fisc uh, from financial issues be the, the, the catalyst we need? Some economists think we need to look for other sources of growth for the world. The financial sector has not driven inclusive growth that much. What are your thoughts? Well, the, uh, it, it is correct that um, when we look at uh, inequality globally, um, it has over the last couple of years uh, somewhat worsened. And that is a trend we have to arrest and reverse. How do we do that? Well by making sure that uh, there is uh, a progressivity in taxation. Those who have more have to help the uh, economy to do better. And also by relentlessly pursuing improvement in the quality of spending for two reasons. One, to get human capital 
and the right infrastructure for development, two, to attract foreign investors, to attract local savings to turn into investments. So uh, as much as the public spending uh, matters, even more so matters how private mm. savings turn into a productive capital. And for that, trust. An investor have to feel confi mm. investors have to feel confidence that if they make an investment, it would lead to benefits for them as well as benefits for society. Imagine markets and sub-Saharan African countries particularly feel hard done by. The markets usually take a dimmer view of their outlook. Mm -hmm. And then by no fault of theirs, for example, when the US Fed cuts their mm -hmm. rates, yep. capital moves out, currencies fall, Nigeria, Ghana, lots of them. You are from an emerging market, so you understand this better than most. What kind of anchors should emerging market SSA countries put in place to reduce their vulnerability to these external actions that really are not their fault? Well, the uh, uh, best uh, avenue to pursue that is get your policies in good order. Get your institutions to deliver transparently for the economy, for people. Nothing is more effective than strong macroeconomic mm. and financial performance in a country. Uh, we have seen in Ghana, uh, yes, it was the COVID shock that pushed so much uh, hardship on people, but it was also excessive spending during an election uh, period. Learn lessons from the past, apply them for the future. Mm. You've given us $1.2 billion in Ghana. What's that? What's the signal? We got 600 million. You did your first review, another 600 mm. million. Are we stabilizing? Mm. Are we recovering? I, I want a, an adjective yeah. to describe where we are. Well, thank you for this question. Gives me a chance to prove that optimism is justified. Uh, Ghana is doing well. Uh, we see growth prospects for Ghana improving. We projected 1.5% growth for uh, this year. Uh, it reached 2.3%. 2023 and 2024, we see good prospects for growth. Uh, we projected inflation to fall from 54% to 27. It is now already 23. Uh, and we see more interest in investing uh, in Ghana uh, because you have a fantastic country, natural capital, abundant, human capital, also abundant. Uh, and as long as there is a determined government to keep the strength of the uh, uh, economic fundamentals uh, at par with the aspirations of people here, Ghana is set for a good so time So we are ahead. stabilizing. You are stabilizing. We are definitely stabilizing. We see it in exchange rate, no more jumping up and down as it did uh, uh, before. Uh, we see it in the advancements of negotiations with the uh, uh, creditors of Ghana, with the official creditors and the private sector uh, creditors. Uh, and uh, I am, uh, while I would say this, stay the course. The job is not yet done. Mm. We are climbing a mountain, we are high, but not at the peak just yet. Uh, I, am, uh, I am optimistic from what I have seen. Some people feel the most important number is the debt to GDP. Mm. And they feel inflation is giving us a false sense of security because the, the nominal debt mm -hmm. because of inflation, mm -hmm. it looks smaller. So the debt to GDP is coming down. So it's almost like the central bank wants to inflate away the debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any cautions there, and do they have a point when, when they say the government is trying to inflate away the debt? So, uh, yes, the two knots of caution. One, we do need to have anchors and then stick to them. Uh, for uh, Ghana, what we are proposing is 55% uh, net present value debt to GDP and 18% max the share of debt service into government revenues anchor your uh, situation in a, in, a, in a clear, stable uh, manner. And two, we uh, recommend that 
uh, Ghana takes uh, a um, very serious look at how the fiscal situation in the future can be stable. So we don't go up and down again. Uh, and we are recommending a fiscal council, mm -hmm. reputable people, independent, able to say objectively, this line of spending, yes, and this one, no. Some people feel the IMF was very lenient in agreeing to the program in terms of the staff work. The board was quite quick to say yes because you were desperate for a good story, which has to be Ghana. <laughs> now, this program, the middle point is an election. And if you look at uh -huh. every election, your deficits have gone up except 2004. Isn't it too risky to be sounding this optimistic when we know from history that every election year, because of the pressures on the fiscal side, things tend to go awry. Look, uh, of course, we can see retreat based on a desire for short-term gains. But this is not what I heard mm. here in Ghana. Mm. From the president to the vice president, to the minister of finance, to the central bank governor, I got one message. Ghana is determined to stay the course. Uh, and I'll tell you, yes, we want to see Ghana succeeding. No question about it. It, it, it has all the reasons to be successful. But this is not why we came so quickly to support Ghana. We did it because we quickly reached an agreement on tough measures to be taken for the benefit of people in Ghana. And I want to tell those who are listening to us, there will be benefit from the pain you're experiencing today because a country that is strong in its fiscal position that doesn't own too much to others is a country poised for success. I like the analogy you gave recently when you said, even though the best time to put up the roof is when the sun is shining, mm. you still need the roof when the rain is falling. So it's, it's in a sense, and this is my final question, by the way, mm. we, we seem to be building a roof in the middle of a rain. Mm. And because of the structural reform, taxes are quite high. People are not very happy. People are, are complaining mm. a lot. What, what's the guarantee that this roof we are building in this rain will benefit from the house, <laughs> especially as poor people? You know, I, um, I lived in a country that went through an incredibly painful adjustment, Bulgaria in the mid-90s. If you think that you have an inflation problem, mm. look at us. Inflation <laughs> was 8,300%. The pain on people was enormous. But that pain translates into building fiscal discipline. Debt to GDP is 23% in Bulgaria today. Wow and creating a strong, vibrant economy. Income per capita quadrupled. We, people in Bulgaria are four times better off. So yes, there is pain. But if we are persistent, if we do the right thing, yeah. uh, that would be uh, beneficial for, for, for society. Thank, there's a bonus question that, <laughs> there's a bonus question. And of course, the IMF doesn't tie your, your, your support with social human rights issues, but it's a big LGBT law that has been passed. Mm. And we do know that your sister organization, the World Bank, has concerns about this. And we do know that sometimes mm. assurances and partner financing see your programs through. What's your general concern? Have you spoken to the president, mm. the vice, and all the teams? Have you spoken to parliament? Are you, what's your thoughts around how Ghana can navigate this mm. in order to jeopardize the program? Well, I understand that uh, people in Ghana have taken this law to the courts. And uh, all I can say is that a more inclusive society is a more successful society. Uh, you want uh, Ghana to flourish. Make it so that everybody can contribute to the fullest to this country. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Kristalina Georgieva. First person from an emerging market since 1944 to be head of IMF as managing director. Long may it continue. We are rooting for you. Thank you for joining us on the program. This has been an intro. When we come back, we'll take you into the panel discussion where she spoke about how AI 
can catalyze growth if done properly. This is the point of view. Don't go away. Upgrade with your recoded GCP mobile app and do more with ease. Send and receive funds seamlessly. Your recoded GCP mobile app is fast. Use it to pay all bills and enjoy the convenience. No worries. Top up on all types of ECG prepaid meters easily. Your GCB mobile app makes that possible with this smart card reader. Pay your subscriptions and fees to over 150 merchants. It is safe and timely. All transactions on GCB Mobile App are smooth. GCB Mobile App, upgrade your style. GCB Bank, your bank for life. Your health is in your hands, but at some point, it passes on to us. At Mintuba Hospital and Coloproctology Center, we believe that quality healthcare isn't a privilege it's a right. Equipped with cutting-edge technology, we are fully prepared to effectively deal with all colorectal and proctological conditions. Our team of highly skilled doctors, surgeons and nurses are renowned for their expertise in minimally invasive and painless laser, ligature and longoproctological surgery. We are committed to providing a wide range of services to meet the diverse needs of our patients. Mintuba Hospital, your health is our priority. Visit Mintuba Hospital today or call us at 0244-581-541 or 0271-054-204. Mintuba Hospital, in to serve a peculiar health need. stories begin right here and we never write them alone sometimes we write them with someone who puts our story first other times with someone who puts their own story first there'll be pages we love to read again and again and some we'll barely remember sometimes we feel like the hero of our story and other times, not. There are stories of dreamers, stories of creators, stories of strivers, stories of believers, and we're inspired by them all. That's why we invite you to write your story with us. Your story matters. Hey, how far with your internship? To be honest, I'm so nervous about starting this new world on Monday. Oh, please. I know you'll be great at it. You should be worried about what benefits they have. Example, do they have health insurance? I doubt they will have that for internet. But no shaking. I have NHIs already. Actually, I'm still aligned. Tin, tin, tin. Ina, look at you. What are you going to do in your office when you can just download your app to register for an NHIs membership? Yes, my people. You heard right. You can now download and register your membership on my NHIS app. No long queues or tedious paperwork. All you need is your Ghana card to register for yourself and for others. Once you register, you get a new digital NHIS card on your phone. My NHIS app gives you access to credentialed health facilities and services across the country. NHIS covers over 95% of disease conditions in Ghana. Access to healthcare just got easier. Now let me sign up quickly. Miss Seth, I'm starting work next month. As the MD, it's been crisis after crisis. COVID has come in. 2021 was a bit of a recovery year. Growth has been low. Now there's inflation. So a listener wanted me to ask you, 
are you interested in AI because it's an escape for you from all the big problems that you have to solve? <laughs> or is there a sense in which this AI thing is the solution to some of the problems you are trying to solve with the low growth and what AI can do? So let's start off with you, Madam. Uh, let me first uh, thank the honorable ministers and all the uh, uh, those in th the audience for being here. Uh, I uh, think of uh, AI as the best chance we have to overcome a long period of low productivity and very slow growth. So what is our story? We are in a world that is changing very rapidly, is a more shock-prone world, it demands from policy makers agility and ad adaptability that was not there in the decades before. And it is presenting to us both incredible challenges like climate change and fabulous opportunities like the green economy and artificial intelligence. I, for one, am optimistic for the future of humanity. We have been able to overcome in the centuries before tremendous challenges and now is the time to do it again. Fit in this picture. This is the likely largest transformation of our economies that we have experienced since the Industrial Revolution. It can be this big bang that allows us to live longer, healthier, better educated, more productive lives. But it is not given <laughs> that we would take advantage of the benefits and manage well the risks. We actually face urgently the necessity to embrace artificial intelligence and make the best out of it. And I'm going to make, if you allow me, just two points at the start of this. The first one is how concerned we all are at the IMF that growth may be uh, here this year, next year, the year after, but it is well below the annual average we had in the decade before COVID. Before COVID, the world economy grew on average 3.8%. Now it grows on average around 3%. And what it means is that there is very little to inject improvements in standards of living, when we think of what can lift up productivity, by far our best chance is in investing in the green transition and in the adoption of artificial intelligence. We can see three, four, five percent productivity gain if we go forward with artificial intelligence effectively. So this is my first point. We desperately need something that would inject more dynamism in the world economy. Second, we also need to recognize that the scale of impact of artificial intelligence is gigantic. Uh, when we looked at the labor market's impact, over the next years, in advanced economies, some 60% of jobs would be impacted. In emerging markets, 40%. In low-income countries, 26%. So this is like a tsunami hitting the labor markets. We have to think how we can make the best out of it, prevent artificial intelligence instead of source of good to turn into a source of inequality, mm. misinformation, deep fakes, distortion in our lives. Thank, thank you for that. 
And on the last point you made, at the bottom of your report, this 125 countries that you surveyed, it's quite interesting that the countries that are most ready, the Singapore's, the Denmark's, the US's, they obviously will face a bigger risk, but they are readier. And then the poorer countries who have a, a lower risk for their labor markets are not that ready. What are some of the country specific things that mm -hmm. have to be put in place to move a country into greater readiness? Uh, we, we identified four areas where uh, progress has to be made and different countries are in a different place with regard to those areas. Number one, digital infrastructure. Uh, without it, it is very difficult to capture the of, uh, of uh, artificial intelligence. Um, what we know is that digital infrastructure is more advanced in advanced economies. Uh, we know that in Africa, on average, uh, access to the internet is uh, still only 50% of the population. Some countries do better, uh, but some countries do, do worse. Second area, and to me, is the key for success, investment in human capital and in uh, flexible, adaptable labor markets. Uh, when we look at countries that have strong, dynamic, agile labor markets and investment not in mechanical learning, but in learning to learn, ability to shift from one task to another, uh, the Denmarks of this world, the Singapores of this world, they're better prepared. Three, innovation and how it fits into entrepreneurship. Uh, you can have uh, research and development, but not feeding into the dynamism of, of the economy. And fourth, regulation and ethics. Mm. And what is so interesting to me is when we did our assessment of preparedness, the United States that is way ahead in terms of advancing artificial intelligence, the so-called Magnificent Seven, the seven companies that dominate are all in the United States, they did not come up as number one in this index. It was Singapore followed by Denmark. What is uh, in the United States still not quite there? It is actually uh, human capital mm. universally prepared uh, for it. And then right. of course, regulation and ethics. Thank you very much for that, because that segues into my question for Minister Esla, because digital infrastructure is number one on the four, and it appears to be what the Vice President yourself have been drumming home for the past few years. We didn't do that great on the list, but give us a sense of how Ghana, as a case study, is preparing for this air revolution with your investments in digital infrastructure, as an example. And it's a pleasure to be on this distinguished panel as well. Um, what have we been doing in the past eight years, seven years, to prepare ourselves for the onslaught, which is staring us in the face? As you've indicated, digital infrastructure has been big on our agenda, and with the help of our development partners, particularly the World Bank, we've done a lot towards putting in place the critical underpinnings for our digital economy. It's important that we put in place our national ID system. We've done that. We needed a proper addressing system. We've put that in place. We needed to focus on digital financial services and in financial inclusion. And we've worked a lot, we've done a lot towards doing that as well. But absolutely critical to all of that. All these systems would have to work right on the infrastructure underpinning all of that, that's connectivity. And so we've worked with the private sector to extend the network of fiber infrastructure that we have in place. So I see what, is hap what has happened in the past few days as a bit of a blessing in, dis in disguise to focus our attention on the need to invest even more in providing connectivity to all parts of the continent and our country because it can help us leapfrog and this is not just a cliche. Yep. We did that with banking when we didn't put in place the normal banking infrastructure but moved towards mobile banking. We've done that um, in, in a few other areas. And we can use digital infrastructure to transform 
the economies of the continent if we invest in putting them in place. We put in place a government connectivity network with the support of the World Bank, which is nationwide. We intend to layer on that and the infrastructure that we already have in place. NITA has fiber. We have the rural telephony pro program, which is extending connectivity to about 20 percent, 4 million of our populace across the country that are interconnected. We need to pull all these pieces together and layer on them a robust 4G, 5G network nationwide, which will ensure that all parts of our country, public, private sector, mm. the private sector can also utilize that mm. capacity yeah. to fill in the gaps where they are. And what we have learned is absolutely critical these past few days is that we need to build resilience mm. in the connectivity infrastructure that we have in place and look at a mix. Mm. We haven't utilized satellite um, infra, um, infrastructure or connectivity as much as mm. we should have, largely because of the cost. Mm. It's expensive. And so we need to talk to the satellite service providers to see mm. how they can utilize this technology to provide us with some kind of backbone yeah. connectivity infrastructure, which will enable us to reach all parts of our country wow. quickly, but affordably. Mm. Because the internet that we provide has to be accessible, has to be used, and has to be affordable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it is just there, and large parts yeah. of our population cannot have access to it. Thank you for that. The, the previous point you made about the blessing in disguise, I would like to be like a fly in the next <laughs> cabinet meeting where road minister is asking for more money, finance minister housing minister is asking for money, and then you say, by the way, there's no connectivity for this meeting, so you know what we're saying. Uh, so I, I can see how this can help you. And also the point about satellite, I think we know a few months ago, one satellite operator who incidentally tried to take a bet on AI has been trying to launch a service here, and the regulator said they were not licensed to operate. I, this is not a local program, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that satellite is coming on stream. Absolutely, it has to. My substantive question, though, is I'm not sure if the panel was divided, because there are two engineers, an economist and a lawyer, right? For most <laughs> new things, regulation is the issue. Listening to everybody, we're told the regulators don't seem to know really how to catch up with this AI thing. What is Ghana's regulatory readiness for the... She spoke, for example, about mis- and disinformation. A lot of bad things that can happen with this. How is Ghana's regulatory framework being put in place to ensure that the benefits are harvested but the ills are reduced? Actually, we've been working at this for a while. We have a draft AI strategy and ethics policy, which is currently awaiting um, cabinet approval and would be utilized. Now, it's important that we carry the population along. If you're in a room of full of techies and you're talking about AI, everybody understands what you mean. But people get spooked when you mention the potential impact on the labor market. And so how do we position ourselves in such a way that we can benefit from the advantages of AI? Why minimizing its negative impact on society? And it's a tool. Every tool can be used for good of mm -hmm. evil by the people who wield it. And so if we look at what happened in the US movie industry recently, with all the agitations about the potential AI's impact on the creative sector and the, the possible loss of jobs, it is cutting across everywhere. So we need to balance it by um, engaging in a whole lot of advocacy to enable people to understand that like everything else, the benefits far outweigh the dangers. And then working to minimize the dangers as well. And we can do that by assisting our regulators to also be up to speed on the challenges out there and how to mitigate it. Now, you don't want to overregulate it so that you stifle the growth of the sector. You cannot also allow it to just mushroom out of um, proportion without any guidance. Mm. And, and, and by so doing, um, feel the full brunt of the negative impact. So this year, under the Ghana Digital Acceleration Project, which is being funded by the World Bank, and mm. I see them here in the room. So this is a subtle nudge to them to speed up the implementation <laughs> of this project as well. We're going to have a mm. regulatory sandbox mm. through which all the regulators, the NCA, NITA, 
and all the others, digital, uh, the data protection um, authority as well, can sit and then map out the strategies that we're going to use to guide our full-scale implementation or, and, um, of, of all these AI-assisted tools as well. Thank you. Please answer of the minister. This is our live conversation on AI as a catalyst uh, for transformation in Africa. And we're live here at uh, Accra. I want to go to Patrick next. Too many questions for you. Software engineer, Microsoft, dial-up internet many years ago. AI, we're all worried. Usually you give me a sense of reality when it comes to technology. Are you optimistic? Are you scared? Are you cool? What's going to happen with AI before I even get to education? Just give me a sense of how I should feel about this buzz around generative AI and what it's going to mean for all of us. Well, I am mostly optimistic. Yeah. I think it's going to be a wonderful enabler mm -hmm. um, across the economy in different sectors. In terms of what it means for education, <laughs> <laughs> we need to give an award for the the most optimistic public official I've ever seen. <laughs> optimism is a middle name, so it's George Yeva, optimism, and the rest of the names. So Patrick, you're optimistic. What does it mean for, for example, how your students learn, right? Because some people are saying, people don't want to learn anymore, LLN. It's going to make it easier for them to cheat, for example. So as a university founder, who's also an engineer, talk to us about what this means for your students and how you, 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 you process knowledge. All right, so that's a very interesting question. Um, the LLMs are such a powerful tool that um, students who use them can use them to an extent where it actually disables learning mm. because you have the machine doing the work for, mm. for you. But for us, the way we look at it is we say to students there are different kinds of assignments that they're given. So there, there are going to be some assignments where they're not supposed to collaborate with anyone, not to use any agent, human or otherwise, um, and it's supposed to be individual work. And instructors are very clear about that because we want them to learn the fu fundamentals themselves. There will also be assignments where they are required, actually, to use, to work with other agents. So, for example, they might be given an assignment where they're, it's a team effort. They're supposed to work with other humans um, on a project. They might be given assignments where they're supposed to use um, a machine intelligence as part of the project. And it's, it's, the thing that's interesting about this is, I think f for the first time when I talk about you know, this question of whether to use technology or not, we've always thought of technology as just tools. And for, for the first time, I find myself using an analogy of teamwork with other humans to say that a machine might be a member of your team is a really sort of profound place to be. But it is, it is a reality of the workplace now that you're, they're going to go out into industry and they're going to work with other people. They're going to work with machine intelligence to get things done faster and better. And it is our job to prepare them for that world. So what do you tell your computer science professors or your students, right? Tomorrow morning, what's, because of course, when Ashesi started, things were moving fast, but not this fast, right? So what would you say to them in terms of making sure we're ready for the kind of world that they would grow up and live in? It's the same thing I, would tell, I, I said to them 20 years ago. I mean, 20 years ago, if you remember when Ashesi was starting, we were giving team assignments to students. And many universities thought teamwork was not correct. Mm -hmm. you, you, wanted to, you wanted to really focus on what does this individual know. Well, we ended up making teamwork one of the core uh, learning outcomes for Ashesi. And the other, another core learning outcome for Ashesi is technological competence. And so we want students to be competent in the technology of, of the time. But beyond, beyond this, I think that there, um, there are very fundamental things that we should all be teaching in universities. Um, it's really important to think about mindset. Mm -hmm. It's very important to think about work ethic. 
it's very important to think about ethical thinking and critical thinking and design thinking and systems thinking. And all of these we have to do. Um, and mm. so not just focus on just the technology per se, but these sort of important broad ways of thinking, mm. because that's what ends up giving us productivity that we need. Round of applause for Patrick, please. Thank you. Now, Jason, I'm sort of working my way backwards here because I should have started with you in a way, but it's fine. No. It's, it's fine. And, and by the way, the internet outage, Google has been on all your platforms. Uh, I understand your, is it the Equium cable? Yeah. It's, it's right. working. So a round of applause to Google. They, I don't know if you saw this coming. Yeah. Thank so you. Google has always been prescient, right? But help us how epochal is generative AI, like steam engine, electricity, internet. Is it as wild, using a Ghanaian expression, as it's been made to seem? Is it, that, is, it, is it that different in terms of how it's going to change everything? Or are we making so much of it just because we understand it? Yeah. No, thank you. Um, and thank you to your excellencies, your honor, and thank you for being part of this, uh, inviting me to this distinguished panel. Um, yes, AI is, AI is novel. Um, so one way to think about it, it, it cuts across all sectors, um, healthcare, manufacturing, finance, transportation, education. And it's not just an improvement in efficiency, but it is fundamentally different. It can, AI can help uh, solve complex problem uh, uh, solving tasks. Um, there's real-time language translation. This is uh, incredible. The generative capabilities that you mentioned, we can generate text documents, uh, images, videos. We can summarize documents. Um, and these creative capabilities are, are quite radical. Um, and we can use AI for scientific breakthroughs, including the investigation of AI itself. What I want to emphasize is that there's an opportunity here for Africa to leapfrog into the new economy by uh, when we use AI in an effective way. So I'll illustrate with a few examples that we're working on here in Ghana. So in our, in our lab that we have here in Accra, we employ uh, engineers and scientists from across Africa, um, Cameroon, Senegal, Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan, South Africa, Ghana, of course. Um, and we focus on using AI to address problems that are relevant to Africa. So I'll mention a few of those. Mm -hmm. One is uh, weather forecasting. Um, agriculture is incredibly important in, in Africa. And w accurate weather forecasts can help tell you, advise you when to plant, what to plant, what the pest load is going to be, what about diseases. But unfortunately, uh, weather forecasts in Africa are terrible. They're really not, currently, they're not much better than looking it up in a book for the typical weather for this day. Um, and we're using AI technology to develop weather forecasts that are accurate um, using novel data sources, including satellites. And this AI technology is relatively cheap. There are great weather forecasts in the US and Europe. Those forecasting tools are extremely expensive. They require national kinds of budgets. Um, AI technology, in contrast, is within reach of African meteorological organizations. Another effort we're working on, um, Africa is extremely linguistically diverse. There are thousands of languages spoken here. We work to collect language data so that we can provide uh, tools like automatic language translation, real-time language translation. In fact, we worked with uh, uh, Professor Isaac Wif at uh, University of Ghana to co collect data for African, for Ghanaian languages, including Twi, uh, Akan, Ga, uh, Dagara, Dagbani. Um, these tools uh, provide accessibility to African audiences. And I'll give a third example that I think illustrates how we can improve, uh, we can assist skills. Um, the population is growing rapidly in Africa. Um, we expect the population to double over the next 30 years or so by 2050. This is, this is quite rapid. And unfortunately, over 800 women each day die due to preventable causes during pregnancy, and this is largely due to lack of diagnostic tools. For instance, uh, um, ultrasound, uh, which is a, a main diagnostic tool for um, 
observing the fetus. Um, that equipment costs on the order of $100,000 to $300,000 and requires two years of training to, to utilize it, making it out of reach of most parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Fortunately, recently, there is cheaper equipment, um, but that doesn't address the training problem. So mm -hmm. we have been working with, uh, uh, together with uh, Jack Randa Health in Kenya to use AI technology. It runs on a smartphone. You take this cheaper ultrasound equipment. It's a wand. It costs on the order of three to $5,000. And using the AI technology, you can instruct an untrained, uh, relatively untrained, uh, mm. unskilled worker to use that. Um, the instructions are to move to a midwife or a nurse, move this device over the patient's abdomen. Then the AI assembles that result into an ultrasound that supports a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So this is addressing a real problem. It's right. also creating a way for workers to uh, wow. perform a task that was not possible before. Th thank you, Jason, for yeah. those examples. My last question for you before I sort of mix yeah. it up is, look, they call you the big four, Google, Microsoft, um, Apple, Facebook, mm. one, yeah. one f author infamously called you the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? <laughs> Even with what we know, we, yeah. we see, particularly in the US and Europe, a lot of discussions with regulators about what's ethical, children accessing Facebook and this kind of things. There's a lot of concern that even with the known, these large companies, sometimes the, the ethics are very movable in terms of governance and regulation. Yeah. What, what commitment is Google AI making to us that whatever happens with generative AI, you're going to commit yourself to being ethical in the right. deployment, mm -hmm. being conscious of the, the low internet literacy, digital literacy, particularly in SSA, right? Just, if the world is watching, tell us what you say in relation to that before I, I, I mix it up here. Yeah, no, exactly. So I would point back to Google's AI principles. Uh, chief principle is that AI should be beneficial, um, should not be misused, um, it should be free from bias. And there are, there are both, there are technical ways to assure that uh, it's, that it can't, that it's unbiased, uh, that we can address, um, and that it's beneficial. Now, um, on the technical side, we have ways to ensure that this, um, to help ensure that this technology cannot be misused. This needs to be done in collaboration with uh, governance. Right? Wonderful. Put your hands together for the panel. But, but for most people listening in Ghana, it, the sequence would be the macro fundamentals must be right. Prices must yes. be stable. They must be, they yes. must have access to credit. Yep. Yep. Then they must have the lights on. Mm -hmm. Then they must have internet they can pay for mm -hmm. yep. before they can think about AI. Is that the sequence in which that you think about sequence. this? Look, what we learned from the pandemic, think about it, the most important lesson. Countries with strong fundamentals, good fiscal, good monetary policy, they withstood the shock of the pandemic better than countries with fundamentals. Mm. The very same way people with strong immune systems withstood the shock from the virus. Uh, I am, um, uh, I lived in a, in a country that benefited from IMF uh, uh, program. It was really hard. I can tell you there is no substitute for having economies that are functioning really well. And that Fundamentals, this issue of fundamentals uh, applies to our conversation on artificial intelligence as it applies on any other uh, conversation. So, strong fundamentals, people. Wonderful. Put your hands together for the managing director. <laughs> uh, Minister Esla, same question. Fundamentals, right? Power sector. So, whilst AI and all of these things are nice things, they, they tend to be like an afterthought for us in these parts. Because if the lights are off, everybody's in trouble. Nobody wants doom so anymore. If the prices of food are high, a Greek minister is angry. So basically, it's almost like you're always struggling to tell them that this is the future. Invest in it. So when the vice president, for example, said the new economy is digital, he was greeted with a lot of sneer. Like, yeah. what are you talking about? The fundamentals are weak. Just talk to me about how you, you hope to work your way to keep, whilst the main thing is the main thing, 
to still let Ghanaians see that they must allocate more to strengthen our digital infrastructure? I think the lessons we learned from the pandemic, one, that without digital connectivity, it was difficult to do anything at all during the um, shutdowns or whatever, when we were stuck at home. And the in contemporary ones that we're living through currently. So it's important, yes, to keep the lights on and all of that. We need electricity to even power our internet systems. But it is also important, it doesn't have to be an either or mm. situation. We can develop all these critical systems alongside each other. And we really do need all of that. And we can solve multiple problems if we invest in digital not least being the unemployment situation. Give our young people the critical skills that they need to engage with the digital world. They can create their own jobs and wean themselves off any support from either their families or, or the, the society. Europe is thinking about training one million people in AI. Where are we as a continent? We cannot also create another digital AI divide. Mm. Right. We have to be part of the ongoing conversation. Be at the table. I'm glad Google's research center is in Ghana. So the language models that they're de developing will take our peculiar situations also into account. But we need to give our young people the critical AI skills that they need so that they can be part of those who will be utilizing these systems for the growth of our economies, yeah. enable us to get the revenues that we need yes. to develop all the other sectors. So we need to focus on digital infrastructure applications and, and, and Patrick, skills. what are you doing on the young people's side? Ashesi is great, but we all can get into Ashesi. We have millions of people who drop out of secondary school they can't get into university because it's very expensive. I know you have scholarships and all these things. So based on what Minister is saying, what's the best way to equip our young people to be ready for this future beyond the example of Ashesi? So that's a very big question, Bernard. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at Ashesi, and then I'll talk about what you guys should be helping us with, if you don't mind. Uh, so... Um, with the Shesi, we've taken the approach of collaborating with universities across a continent mm -hmm. because we recognize that no one institution can handle the scale of the problem alone. And so we've set up a collaborative seven years ago. We've had professors and deans and vice chancellors from over 400 universities that participate in it. And we are basically sharing everything, curriculum, pedagogy, we're advising each other on how to do better research and all of that. And I think all boats are going to rise because of this effort. I think the question that you ask, though, is, is a very big, more fundamental question. If we really want to advance, we talk about human capital, we have to educate everyone. And we have to educate them well. It has to be a high quality education. And high quality education is expensive. And governments in low- and middle-income countries are constantly strapped for funding to do all that they need to do, infrastructure, roads, water, all of that. So really to get this right, we need long-term financing. When I say long-term, like 30 years mm -hmm. financing, that is affordable for governments to educate everyone mm -hmm. and sort of have the faith that in 30 years, if we've educated everybody really well, our economies will rise to such an extent that we can pay back that debt. But if the, if the financing is expensive, then you're stuck. You, you end up with situations like what we're in now in Ghana, where you, you go into debt that is not sustainable, and you just, you're just stuck. So... Uh, I would say that it would be really wonderful if so the global community could come to, to a consensus on enabling affordable long-term financing to educate planet Earth, like get everybody educated mm -hmm. really well, understanding and believing that if we take that long-term view, all boats will rise. And mm -hmm. that's, a, you know, that's a project that's beyond my pace. 
great. <laughs> but it's within yours, madam. <laughs> so they can help you. Yeah. Let me end with Jason. Google was the greatest invention until AI came, right? <laughs> so, but one of the things you did which was impressive was you didn't just say we have the greatest invention, search is wonderful and all of these things you're doing. Mm. You actually laid a subsea cable to make sure it's always on in Africa. So my question is, do you have an Africa AI strategy beyond the examples and the use cases? Mm. What's, what's Google thinking around sub-Saharan Africa and how, what are you going to put in place to make sure we don't miss out? Yeah. Um, I want to actually add to what Patrick said. So we, we live in a time with enormous opportunities and enormous challenges across the board, not just AI. But AI is a tool that we can use for our benefit. As I said before, we want, in the ideal case, what we want from AI is to leapfrog into the new economy. We want to provide skills that are going to give workers what they need mm -hmm. to be productive, to, to build our economies. We need some part in training uh, to uh, train people how to use AI effectively. On the positive side of this, AI is a technology that can benefit, benefit us in many different ways. Key, AI technology is much cheaper, it tends to be much cheaper than other technologies that are out there. I talked about weather forecasting. AI technologies are relatively cheap in that regard, making them accessible within Africa. That's one aspect. In regard to teaching, it's not just that we have to go it alone. We talked about LLMs. What is the role of LLMs in education? Is it just for plagiarizing? Is it just for cheating? It's not, that's not the only way that you can use it. These are also tools that you can use to accelerate, to, to accelerate training. The AI technology is a mechanical tool that you can use to interact with students and, get, and teach them abilities. Uh, in our economies, we're going to see workers have to retrain for new tasks over their lifetimes, perhaps multiple times. AI assistants can help them in that retraining. And this is particularly useful in sub-Saharan Africa, where we can use this technology to lift our lower skilled workers and give them skills that are comparable to higher skilled workers in other parts of the world. So it, I see it as a great equalizer. And that's the strategy that we want. This is a call to you. The dreamers. The ones that see no boundaries. Dreamers take a chance. The explorers that chart their own path. Unlock the vibes, connect the energy. The ones that dare to challenge the status quo. Get connected, feel the vibes. When others try to think outside the box, you wonder what box. Catch the wave, enjoy the ride. To the architects of their journeys. Every connection is an opportunity to explore every experience. This is your call to adventure. Your journey begins here. Be bold. Be daring. Be free. Connecting passions. Connecting dreams. Connecting ambitions. Telesel. Connecting energies. Ow. Let me see. She's never had a toothache before. Hmm. There might be a cavity. Don't you use Pepsodent? We used to, but I'll try the new one. Ah, that's why. But doesn't every toothpaste give cavity protection? Not really. Pepsodent's Cavity Fighter repairs tiny invisible holes to give 10 times stronger teeth. Will you trust Pepsodent? Definitely. Pepsodent, 10 times stronger teeth. <laughs> use Pepsodent's Cavity Fighter. Have you been to Aqua Safari lately? Let me share my experience with you at the new Aqua Safari Resort. When you arrive, you're greeted by warm smiles to Aqua Safari and introduced to your 24 hour butler who already has your itinerary sorted. Enjoy water sports activities like jet ski rides, 
kayaking, water sliding, flyboarding, and cast net fishing. You can even have your lunch here on the boat cruise. Experience horseback riding, tennis, and some golfing amongst a host of other activities. Let the tour guides take you through the sceneries of the Volta River, the mangrove forest, the friendliness of the animals, local and exotic birds, while you pet and feed them. You can have this large space for your conferences, corporate retreats, and so many activities as part of the package. We chose to have our breakfast with a beautiful sunrise right in front of our cabin. We had an amazing experience and I can't wait to return for more. Visit Aqua Safari Eco Resort in Ghana, bringing you closer to nature. So on those powerful four points, we end today's show. I've been speaking in the first part to the MD of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva. And then, of course, I moderated a panel featuring her, the Minister for Communication, Esla Owusu Ekufu, and, of course, Jason Hickey of Google and our own Patrick Ewa. Hope you've learned a thing or two, not just about economics, but also about AI. Thank you for watching this special edition. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.